Okay, so this is our real thoughts on Jupiter Ascending. Uh, uh, not gonna be that different from the review. <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, there's a couple things interesting about this, though. I actually... I found this film... The most interesting thing about it is the fact that there was a part homage to Terry Gilliam in it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I almost, Terry I'm Gilliam like, man, decided. that was kind of awesome. Wish it was in a better movie. <laughs> yeah, no, and uh, I, honestly, I thought it was really cool to see, like, the little Brazil homage and stuff. But yeah, it just was... It was that was just like a total tone change and like universe change. Like we're just the in a totally movie different universe. Is a now. tonal shift. Yeah, there's none uh, of the tones in the movie. It's like there's eight different movies in one, mm. and none of them really connect that well. Well, and it's this is one that I'm surprised it has a very it has a very small following, and I like that I can say very small because the movie bombed big time. So it's not like no everybody loves this and you're right. No, no, this it, is not man. See that's like this is not Man of Steel. No. No, it's not uh, Jurassic World, which I like Jurassic World, but it's it's one of those where it I mean it's universally regarded as a bomb. Yeah. Like I mean it made no money. It's and, maybe the and, final nail in the coffin of the Wachowskis ever doing a big budget film again in the next ten years. And yet the, there is this very small but very vocal minority who goes ape shit if you don't like this movie and it's it's just kind of fascinating it's very I'm, fascinating to me because of all yeah, the films you know to i gotta choose. i gotta i gotta respect it because for me it's kind of like defending like battlefield earth or something it's like, <laughs> you know what i you know i disagree but i respect your ball <laughs> i respect your balls to go out there and try to say it's a great movie i, I, I never really thought of it that way to I, respect I, this obvious boat sinking into the water because to to, to defend a movie like that and love a movie like that, it's like... And, like, so proudly yeah, defend it, too. Couldn't disagree more, but it's just, you know what? I, I, I admired the, the chutzpah <laughs> of being able to, to just do that. I'm like, that's... that's, that's it, it's either courage or insanity, maybe a little maybe both. Maybe both, uh, who knows? Um, but you know what? I... Good job. <laughs> Well done. I I respect you. You know, don't don't kowtow to anybody's opinion. Just someone out there has to like this. <laughs> it's uh well, and the interesting thing too is that um it, it's such an interesting disconnect between like I don't want to say between reality and the online world because everybody everybody I have talked to like seen physical person have interacted with whenever I say Jupiter ascending they're like, oh that. Piece of shit! It, it's I, either, it gets like a violent reaction. It's either, it's either like oh it. that piece of shit, or meeting people firsthand who've seen it. I have had some that are just like, oh my god, that movie, like that movie was just hilarious. Yeah. Like, but but in that, never taking it, gets, it seriously. Uh, like they they like it only just because it's like, what the fuck was that? See, I'm kind um, of on almost that like the almost almost, almost like the room. Yeah, um, I, I'm kind of on the. I, definitely, Eddie Redmayne is just a treasure in this. Go, world. go. Um, I mean, just an absolute treasure. Uh, is by far the most interesting thing. Uh, but what was fascinating to me watching this movie, and again, I mean, if you like this film, you know, more power to you. I can, like you, I cannot for the life of me understand why. Uh, even films like that I don't like, like Transformers or Twilight or something like that, I see where that audience is. Well, and it's I, very I, have this a hit, one I have a hit and miss relationship with the Wachowskis. So they, there's some that they've done that are classics. I love The Matrix. I, I love, love Bound. I love Bound. Bound's a great movie. I, I saw it again. And still, I'm just gonna say it. Up. I and people are just like, oh, you just don't like later Wachowski movies. Speed Racer is a big guilty pleasure for me. I actually enjoyed <laughs> I that movie. Um, I'm not going to defend it as really a great movie, movie, but like I, but as, that a, was guilty, a, as a guilty too. pleasure film, I'm like, this movie's fun. It's but that's the thing that Jupiter Ascending to me just wasn't fun. It's, that's when yeah, it comes down to it, like the movie at least has to be if it's going to be dumb, at least it has to be fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's maybe why I like Jurassic World. I'm like, well, it was entertaining and fun at least, even if it wasn't as smart as some of the other ones. Um, but it. I just can't. I don't. I don't get it. I just don't I, get yeah, it. Yeah. No. And that's why I think it's so interesting because it is for me. It is so clearly missing the mark of what an epic is supposed to be, but trying to hit these other elements that so many other epics but it have. Does it with such? And this is a Wachowski thing. And there are other filmmakers I think are like this. Where it, again, much like the people who want to defend it, it does it with such. Confidence. Yeah, there, there like, is, a there is not a moment in this. What movie. we're saying is so interesting. Yeah. You will want to there hear us not, talk about it forever. Not, where that sometimes goes. you get the impression that when you watch a film, that even the filmmakers are like, 
Oh my god, I don't know. This is gonna be like they have no faith in their own abilities. Like Fifty Shades of Grey or something. Yeah, like like Fifty Shades of Grey where it's like, we're gonna try to make this good, but you could tell it was just everybody's like, ah like this one, they, the Wachowskis just had such confidence in their batshit crazy vision that I kind of respect that. I'm like, I don't like it. But I just respect that somehow somebody gave them a giant pile of money with this script. Somebody had to have shown this script. To, unless they pulled a bait and switch and rewrote the script, but somebody had to have shown a Hollywood executive this script or screenplay or treatment, and and Warner Brothers said, "Yeah, let's do this. Let's do <laughs> I this. have confidence in this." Um, so uh, the fact that it got made at all is just a miracle, like one of those strange. It kind miracles. of is. Like I, yeah. I, I, I uh, gotta respect it. I the, the Wachowski. That. All I can say is the Wachowskis must be like the most charismatic, nicest people in the world to keep getting these films. They must be games. like those like, guys on Shark Tank that go on, and and the the sharks are just like. You know what? I don't know if I have any faith in this product, but you're such a good salesman, you might be convincing me. <laughs> yeah, there must just be something, I mean, like I said, there must be this charisma or something to them. I mean, I see them on interviews, and they both seem you know, really nice and cool to talk to. It's like, I would love to, like, talk with both of these people, like, you know, about anything. They seem like, it's like Kevin Smith, they just seem like fascinating. Oh yeah, to even talk if the to. movie's not good, like, the, the way their movies play out, I'm just like, I, I would be fascinated to just hear them prattle on about it forever, because I'm like, I want to know what was going on they're, in your head when you made this. They're kind of becoming like my new, uh, like maybe my new Shyamalan or something, because I am, like, even when they do something bad, it is so intriguingly, fascinatingly bad. I, I And the acting's the same, too, yeah, which is and, interesting. It's yeah, all that, that and it's deadpan sort of... Deadpan, a lot of Charismatic, talking. free acting. And then, like, you know, just one person going batshit insane, you know, acting-wise in a movie, uh, you know, or just giving a performance where you're just like, what was going on, you know? So it's one of those things where it's like, even if they're really, really bad, there is something just so intriguing about it. Um, and this film is a very boring film, but even in its boredom, I was kind of fascinated, and that rarely happens. It is like, like watching a train wreck. Yeah, when a very is slow, boring, boring like, train wreck. It's like watching a train wreck in slow motion. You're like, man, I wish this would go faster, but I still can't take my eyes off yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's one of those things where, for most boring films, it's like, it's boring, it's not interesting, done. Where, with the Wachowskis, even when it's boring, I, I'm so intrigued at their choices. It, it's so All fascinating. All I can figure is that the executives, because I'm trying to think, how would an executive green like this? Um, you know, I mean, we always joke about studio executives being idiots and they always want to change things or the worst, but I'm like, how would you have been handed this treatment and just go, yeah, let's make this out? All I can figure is Warner Brothers, the guys up top, thought, ah, another fifth element. Let's do okay. this. Like, I, I'm thinking they looked at it and thought this was going to be more like the fifth element with its goofy characters and its gallivanting across space and it's got its little corporate message in there. And I, that's all I can figure is that they thought they were going to get a fifth element and instead they got... The, well, whatever this is. <laughs> yeah, um, there's something to these, you know, even in Fifth Element, it was kind of one world where it's like in this movie, oh, well, that's the Fifth Element part. Oh, that's the Hitchhiker's Cat the Galaxy. Oh, that's the Star Wars part, and that's the Star Trek part, and that's the... And the Star Trek, even though there's a lot of different worlds and variations and stuff, still seems like this one complete world. This seems and like a number of different universes. Well, part of the problem is she is trapped on Earth that has no idea that there's aliens out there. Whereas Fifth Element, Star Trek, it's all part of one universe where it's the future, we're all aware of aliens, so you, you don't have to go through the same amount of plot exposition. Yeah, I, I think that's but a big by part. making her, and the, the funny thing is, like, it, I laugh because as I was watching this, I was like, I figured it out, this is an anime. Like, I feel like I've seen this anime, Girl... Well, well no, they love anime. Yeah, anime girl, yeah, Girl Trapped on Planet... Aliens bring her out, she falls in love with one of them, she may be a princess, and I'm like, it's like an anime just minus the fun, though. Like, And and you can get away with a bunch of plot ex exposition in anime series that go on for 13 to 26 to 52 episodes. Man, is it tough when you got one movie to <laughs> yeah, dump all, all this on you and just start at the beginning. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll give them this, they made her a queen. It's almost always a princess, and this one, it's like, no, no, you're, you're a queen. You gotta run shit. You're a queen. I mean, I'll, I'll give them that. Yeah. I mean, I don't usually see that. Uh, but, yeah, and, and then I'm fascinated that, you know, okay, for the ladies out there, I understand Channing Tatum, 
I get it. <laughs> you know, you, you want to see your Channing Tatum, you know, with his, you know, moping going, oh, the pain. I had the, the funniest like, thing I, I behind the scenes in the review is I kept trying to instruct Doug how to properly do the. Oh. Yeah. He kept, that's right. Doug kept kept bending his hands like, like no, this. it's like this. He either would do this or this, and I'm like, no, it's it's just loose. Yeah, no, oh. you were really trying to get my oh. hand acting. It was there. just driving me nuts because I'm like, no, it is so fey the way he did it. it was, <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 too stiff, no, 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 too up in the air. I'm like, no, 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 loosen the wrist, loosen the wrist. It's like you're fencing, come on. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the, but I'm so fascinated that so many people, well, I mean, so many people, the people that got into Jupiter Ascending and defended, um, I don't get how you can get behind Mila Kunis's character. She is such a waste. Oh God! Of I, of everything. It, uh, almost from the beginning, I think I ruined it for both of us when I just said, "Shut up, Meg." <laughs> <The second laughs> she started. Yeah, I'm just like, "Oh, that's going in." <laughs> um, I I don't ha I don't hate Mila Kunis. She's but there's always, much worse. She's a polarizing movies, figure, and that but... some people are just like, "Oh my God, Mila Kunis can't stand her." But to put her in a role like this, I, I just, because I'm like, at some point you have to try to accept her as being beyond, you know, just who she is and she's some sort of cosmic force who's also queen and she's reincarnated. And I'm like, I couldn't get there. I, I could get, I couldn't even get her scrubbing toilets because I'm like the hottest janitor I've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, named Jupiter Jones. We scrub <laughs> toilets. God, if we look like Mila Kunis. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, but I, I just, speak for yourself. It's, yeah, it, it, it just... I always looking gorgeous, never look, because it, it literally, literally is a shit job, as someone who's done it. Um, and she's, like, never really dirty. And, like, I'm just, like, I'm just not buying this. This looks like you found some starlet, gave her some rubber gloves like you're a janitor now. And, like, I just didn't believe it. Yeah. No, it's very much the uh, Denise Richards as a uh, nuclear or scientist or something like that, one of the James Bond movies. Like, even for a James Bond movie, that's pushing it a bit. Uh, and I don't dislike Mila, Clu uh, Mila Kunis. I think she can be great in a lot of stuff. Uh, just constantly Mis miscast. Miscasting, I think. Yeah. Well, you said I never saw Oz Great and Powerful, but you said she was in that, and it was all <laughs> She's the Wicked miscast. Witch, and it's about as not working as you would imagine. <laughs> like, even the makeup is just, like, just looks like bad Halloween But hey, makeup. she can command the bees. Right? <laughs> I, I, I was just so fascinated. It's like, no, oh, the bees recognize royalty, and I'm like, okay, cool, I'm sure this will come back again. Like, maybe there's some finale nope. involving bees. That would be crazy and, and kind of awesome. You'd at least have to do something. <laughs> nope, never again. And I'm like, wow. So that, that had no bearing on the plot whatsoever. And, you know, here's the thing, too, because they were... Uh, somebody sent me something on my Facebook sort of talking about, like, certain facts about uh, Jupiter Ascending. You know, and very, very much like, hey, I don't like this movie either, but here, here's some interesting uh, uh, facts. And I have no idea if they're true. I'm getting them from a Facebook post. Do but, tell. But, I'm no, very but, but curious. Well, first of all, they said that Warner Bros. was going to them looking for a big epic, which is very strange, uh, after they pretty much ran the Matrix into the ground, um, oh. and, and have not had a, you know, financial big hits, uh, but, but apparently they were also saying that, um, oh crap, where's well, it going? and I, totally I, I still have yet to see Cloud Atlas, I do really want I've to see I've seen parts it. of it, um, because um, it looked interesting, but I, I'm not... From what little I've seen of Cloud Atlas, I'm not sure I would have looked at them and, like, we need to give these people a lot of money to make a big epic. Because everybody says that Cloud Atlas, whether you love it or hate it, it it does have a confusing kind of... It's its its own thing. Like, yeah, I'll say it's um, not like their other traditional big it's budget very epics. artsy it's, kind of, you know. Yeah, so. it has much more of the artsy feel. And actually, I, I haven't seen the whole film yet, so, I mean, I, I shouldn't, you which know, be means, like, oh, this piece of crap because I was really what? enjoying Speed, the Jim Broadway. Which means what? <laughs> Speed Racer? Was that, have they done anything between Speed Racer and Cloud Atlas? And they, I think they produced a few things. Actually, I don't dislike V for well, they Vendetta. Well, they produced V for Vendetta, and I love V for Vendetta. Yeah, I, I actually they, do. Maybe they should okay. just produce films. I'd be down for that. Um... um uh, although that's the only one I know they produce. Uh, they've done a lot, like, they've done our stuff with, like, the video game uh, Matrix and the Animatrix. And stuff. But even then, that's before the Matrix. But the thing about the Animatrix um, is I liked all of the ones that weren't the Richards. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, the other, the other ones um, that the other Japanese directors did I thought were way yeah, better. Yeah, there's this bizarre... I don't know. I don't know whether I should kind of, like, applaud them for their confidence, because it's like, dude, you're going out there and you're believing in yourself and you're doing it, or if I should be really pissed off that they're not working within the limitations that other authors and writers should be and usually are working in. I think if we got more... Because it's obvious, I think, by casting him in this, maybe one of their heroes is Terry Gilliam. 
Oh yeah, and no, like, obviously we can, say, they love Brazil. we can say the same thing about Gillian. It's like sometimes oh, yeah. you don't know whether you should applaud his confidence and just, I'm going to make this the way I want it. I don't care how over budget it is, how bad shit crazy is it happens. But I feel like overall Gilliam has, generally speaking in his filmography, more better films. Mm -hmm. Like there's more Gillian film, Gilliam films I tend to enjoy. I'll say this, when you see Gilliam, you're like, you're going to see a Gilliam film. You're not going to see him ripping off all these other elements. Or if you are, you're going to see true. them ripping off yeah. classic literature or something that goes way back. Not like 20 years or 40 years back. He's going to rip off like the classic stories and retell them in his own Because, I mean, up Brazil way. is 1984, but it still somehow feels so his own. Yeah, it's so um, obviously his. And it's obviously 1984. Twelve Monkeys right. is amazing, The Fisher King. I just feel like whenever I think of Gilliam, I think of films I like more. Yeah. Um, when I think of the Wachowskis, I think, yeah, Bound, The Matrix. Speed Racer is just a guilty pleasure for me. I'm not going to say it's a great movie. Like, it's, it's not a lot. Mm. Um, but it is that same confidence of just it's my way or our way in their case or the highway there's something about and again i don't know whether this is like something you applaud or sort of go come on now because in a sense you could say they sort of pioneered it that they went to this stuff that was popular like in japan with anime and stuff like that and they made it even more popular here and they're trying to hit on stuff again that's not that old and they're trying to do their spin on it but because i think they grew up with that stuff and they love it so much they're still stuck in that world and they can't branch out into you know our own thing our own wachowski thing which you know they kind of started to with you know the matrix and uh, and bound i would really make an argument was kind of their own thing uh, at the time but then everyone else started to try to copy that See, style. See, if they did they a straight-up anime adaptation, I would rather they produce it. Because mm -hmm. there's definitely, there's so much anime influence in this. The space battles, the the ridiculous costume design. <laughs> yeah. The, like, I, the funny thing is, like, people keep saying, oh, Star Wars is, and I, I see Shades of Phantom Menace and stuff, but I, I, kept, see more seeing, anime in it, I yeah. kept seeing more anime than anything. I'm like, man, I wish this was a better movie, because a live-action anime but, to me would be awesome. Yeah, especially, like, the costumes, and, and even some of the subplots and stuff like that, which are so many. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I remember what I was going to say before with the Facebook person, uh, if that person's watching, um, is that they say it was also influenced by Wizard of Oz. They really like Wizard of Oz. And it's so funny because when you hear that, it's like, oh, the, there's no place like home. But again, it, it, was, it was all a dream done. in the Wizard of Oz. Well, or no, at no, least but, it felt like, you know, you're never quite sure. But it was not done enough with their own... <laughs> feel or their own spin on the message they're just doing that you know and nothing else you know it's kind of like north like oh all this was for the there's no place like home thing well we've seen that you didn't give like your own spin on the message you made it visually and story-wise pretty crazy uh but even then that's not far enough into your own thing either uh so yeah but at the same time like what you're saying about speed racer um uh, which i can't stand that movie. I it, it is like a punch in the face to me. But at the same time, <clears throat> yes, I have this bizarre Ew. respect that I don't even think I've seen the Speed Racer cartoon do anything as fucking weird and batshit crazy looking as this film. Well, and the one thing I was saying when we got out of Jupiter Ascending is Speed Racer, for all of its problems, I admit it's got problems, I know you really hate it, but I'm like, you had to respect that at least... Probably out of all of their films, it was the most straightforward, cut and dry narrative, beginning, middle, end, simple story. <laughs> I, nothing. I don't even remember what the narrative was. It was exactly. just some anti corporate message, and I'm gonna race, and there was like money involved, and do you follow the evil money or race for the love of it? I, it was just very simple. Like I felt like the, the it wasn't that complicated. It was cart. It was really cartoonishly simple. Um, it is whereas, based on a cartoon. Yeah, yeah. Whereas this one was just. I'm like, it is all over the place and then and yet it somehow is all over the place and yet you end up repeating the same story arc three times yeah no that that's like the most bizarre thing to me like three it, times. like i said if you want to if you want to have these complicated backstories and everything like it, it really is why we will travel with frodo and aragon and stuff to these complicated uh backstories and worlds and stuff like that you know and, i'll and go to flossed in paradise yeah you, you'll follow <laughs> yeah. harry potter which is not one of my personal favorites but again i understand the attraction the, the, this world and this environment and these characters you feel like you know them and you feel but like see, when they there. went to flossed in paradise in fifth element they didn't spend 40 minutes talking about what flossed in paradise was yeah they just went there and how it fits into they this universe and, yeah and that is it's funny because for a team that is so 
like visual like they, they got all the, the set design and this is just crazy there is so much telling in that showing like you have these gorgeous visuals and yet you realize that after a while you're just simply looking at 40 minutes of over-the-shoulder shots of people just explaining things. It's like, explain this, explain that, well, explain this, explain that. I think that. for a long time with the 80s and 90s, we got into this thing which is, honestly, even for years, you could say uh, action films and sci-fi films were not dialogue heavy. Actually, sci-fi films kind of were. But traditional action, big budget films were not dialogue heavy, were not big on thought. It was big on action and saying, one line, the shorter the lines, the better. That's why Schwarzenegger was a big hit. Uh, but I, you know what? I won't even go that far because some <coughs> do like Star Trek too. There's plenty of dialogue in that film, but it's natural dialogue and it relays the plot through the dialogue well, and it doesn't feel, except for maybe the end where you get the right to do it or an occasional little speech here or there to state your point, it doesn't feel like endless monologuing. Well, I'm talking about just general action now. Like I said, sci-fi is kind of the exception because you had to explain a lot of the work. There's a lot of philosophy. Um, and... Yeah, and uh, but with uh, but the action films, they, they kept it very short, very simple. And with the rise of, I think, the Wachowskis and Nolan, uh, suddenly they did get very talky. It was at a time where it was very needed uh, and very welcomed. And it was, like I said, it, in a sense, even though we kind of make fun of them now for it, uh, they did sort of pioneer that, that, hey, you can think during an action film, you can be challenged in an action film, and you can talk, and you can express ideas and philosophies and all this stuff, and now we've gotten so much of it, I feel like we sh sort of had to find this balance again, okay, well, now we have this great talking, we can do this, now let's try to find that right balance, and they're still going, they're going to the talking, and they're, we can do even more talking, even more, it's like, no, it's, we can scale it back now, we can just I, have this, you know, we can have some talking, we can have some action, and we can just collide it all together. Well, part of the problem is, it's not that interesting, like, I, I made the comparison, which you ran with, and threw me in there as Gandalf, that it's, instead of reading or watching Lord of the Rings, it's more like listening to the appendixes or the appendices from Lord of the Rings, where it's just like, here's reams and reams of facts and stuff that we're just going to spoon-feed you. And there, there's no emotional weight to it, there's no heft, it's just like, she goes to a new location, it's like, here's some more facts. I Literally, that's what we said, you felt like you were in school. Like, you were just going to be quizzed on this. Like, you had a boring history teacher just telling you a bunch of facts, and then occasionally there would be a space battle. I think there's something, there has to be some, like I said, the big thing is the relatability to the main characters. Because as soon as those characters have you, you'll follow them anywhere. You'll follow them through all the dialogue. You'll follow them through all the tough times. You'll oh, none of them, them are relatable. And, no, and, and that's the, the thing. The closest is maybe Mila Kunis, but <laughs> see, I, even, even that. See, I, 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 was, I can't even get her. <laughs> no, I'm just saying the closest out um, of all of them. But all the other ones, and the, again, it's the same problem with the acting. It's that weird... Shyamalan-esque, Wachowski style of just state your lines, not a lot of emotion, weird awkward pauses, strange lines of dialogue. I like dogs. Yeah, and again, I think I, that comes from like, you know, That was like before, a twilight moment. <laughs> I, I think that comes from, you know, in action films before, you know, they used to be, you know, really uh, grand and, and, and goofy and crazy, have the crazy comic relief, they have all this stuff, you know, and, and they were, especially in the 90s, action films were getting kind of sillier and sillier, and we had sort of the nerdy geek as the star and comedies and stuff. And, yeah, I think they're just like, no, we're really serious, and the way we show we're really serious is we act really serious. Uh, but I again, think they should have gone more for just straight-up comedy. Yeah. I think um, if they did a Fifth Element-style comedy with this, it would have played much better, because I can't take it seriously, and I can't tell some people do consider it a comedy, and they're arguing like, well, the line, I like dogs, like, that's meant to be a funny comedic scene, but I'm like... It's not it, funny! <laughs> uh, yeah, it just didn't, it just came off as weird. Like, I don't know if I'm supposed to laugh at that, or just be you like... You wanna bite me? Like, that, that's a line! <laughs> I, and that the way we really deliver it is Twilight. like something out of Twilight. Yeah, yeah. so... I, um, <laughs> and, and I will say right now, by the way, in Fifth Element... Is a stupid movie. It's so stupid. But, you know, I... It's and keenly it, aware of that. Yeah, I, I, I think it's very aware he of it. He wrote it as, like, a teenager, I think, and it's got that feeling. I'm like, yeah, this is some goofy movie a teenager would want to see. Yeah. It's great. And, and it's hard to say why something like Fifth Element, which is so openly dumb and stupid and just the plot is so idiotic and some of the lines are so idiotic, but it's just so much more enjoyable and relatable than something like this because, A, even though the characters are very simple... I think you got you got good actors to represent them. Honestly, Bruce Willis plays the uh, yeah okay I'll fight action. He does that very well. Mila Kunis in the uh, Mila Kunis, uh, Mila, uh Josephich, Jovovich, 
Lilu <laughs> it does that very well. Uh, In he, lasagna straps. Yeah, uh, you know, Chris Tucker is one of his first big, you know, it, it is so Ian, busy. Ian Holm, Ian Gary Holm Oldman. doing comedy. Gary, I mean, that's a funny thing. Gary Oldman chews scenery left and right, but it's really entertaining to watch. They, they got good people, yeah. and they create this environment that felt very livable. Like, I felt like I could just walk around this world. This was almost like an online world, where it's like, I, I just want to look at the that's creativity a good point, everywhere. I didn't believe... I, the the world in Jupiter Ascending seems so far removed. I believed Dune's universe more, and that's really over the top. Um, this world just... It, it didn't feel livable. It felt like... He couldn't stay in a place long enough to feel like Yeah, it just felt like just constructs, like giant movie sets. I didn't feel like that. I'm like, who lives here? How do you live here? With the eight billion candles and the... I, it, the only one that felt kind of livable was the when they're standing in line to make her queen. But again, that, that was, was the only place I felt relatable. I'm like, yeah. I recognize this. But, <laughs> but again, we've seen it in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. We've seen that in Brazil. And if you want to do it, that's fine. But add a new twist to it. Do something and a little don't different. don't base your story on doing the same thing three times. Like, once we got out of the first story arc, dumped into the second, and I'm like, and he's like, I'm going to force you to marry me so you can sign the contract. And I'm like... Wait, like, are we doing this again? And then when she goes to the final planet in there, to, into Jupiter's eye, and then it's just like, I'm going to kill your family unless you sign the contract, I can take over the planet. I, I'm like, my God, we just did this three times. Yeah, like, no, this, I, I... this story literally went full circle three times. I'm like... Who does that? Yeah, no, I felt like, uh, but but it's a, a different kind of technical reason why oh, they're God, doing it. Yeah, it's somebody, like, no, somebody it's tried to give me the, yeah. thing. Somebody tried the same to give thing. me that argument. Well, but each one has their different strategy. You're and still I'm like, doing the same to thing. do the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> like, no, and there is stuff I left out about, like you know, I think the the second guy, the first guy that wanted to marry her, was like, you know, yes, yeah, because that, my sibling you're talking to before, she's actually using, I guess, oh. soil and green to make herself young or something like that. There's so much talking. You know, so it's like, okay, let, let's just get down to the bare bones of what's going on. Again, just, just shut oh, up no, the my favorite, shut everything my up. Favorite is what they, is going on? They, some you know, people, the, and vocal, it's doing it over and over. the vocal minority crucified you because, here, my God, you missed this detail about this bird in fact, it's scene two in the, in the paragraph three where they said this, <laughs> and how dare you that? And, like, so somebody gave me, like, a list. Like, they literally printed out a list on my Facebook of, like, all the things. I, I put it very simply. I said, there is no amount of facts that we could have discussed, like plot points that would have saved this film and made it good. Yeah. There is no, there is nothing. Like we could have left every single fact out of that movie and it still would not make the movie good. Like I'm glad you think that that one detail is so important and great doesn't Save the movie. No detail. I still don't care about the people. Movie. Nothing got me invested in what was yes, going on. Yes, because the visuals were stolen from a million other places. Because yeah, we don't care about the characters. They're just facts. It is literally like saying in 1492, Columbus discovered the new world. Well, we know even now that's not true. But it's a, it's just like giving off a fact and then saying, "See, that saves the movie." No, it doesn't. Because if you're telling a story and you don't give a shit about Columbus in the story, it's not going to save it. Yeah, so I mean, that that's always my big argument, that even even a bad story can still be saved in a film if the, the characters are good. Not, not often, but it is possible. You know, somebody uh, you know, said the characters that, can yeah. be the saving grace of a film. That's why I think they're the most important. But story's important, too. I mean, it, it's... You know, almost just as important, but the character you somebody can, said as long as you have a good character to carry you through, like that can save a film. And other elements can too, but I think that's the most important to focus on. I had a on. discussion online, and somebody was telling me that the people are that obsessed with the facts of it are not seeing the forest for the trees or whatever. And I, I made the argument that it's a situation where the trees aren't even real. It's a plastic forest. It's all fake. There's no emotion. There's no soul. There's no depth. Really, all you need to do is just give me a real fucking forest. Yeah. <laughs> so. You know, it, it, even Lord of the Rings, I mean, some of the nicest scenes aren't even in any of the fictional places. It's just, just a nice forest. You know, it, there's this time, there are so many times, especially in the books. Well, I wasn't even talking about such effects. I was just talking about the facts. Oh, no, I mean, no. Just, I'm, I'm just talking give about me just characters story. with soul. No, I'm just talking yeah. about, yeah, stories. There's some of the nicest scenes in both the books and the movies of Lord of the Rings is when they're just in the forest and they're just they're sitting around walking and they, they talk a little bit. They, they share a little bit of their character. And in this, 
Even and when they're trying the to have their romance, yeah. it just feels so forced. And we're doing this because we know we have to have the romance now. Because, you know, that's part of epics, right? And everything just felt like, well, this is in a lot of epics, so let's do this. But they missed the, the key elements to make them interesting, which is just care about the people. If you care about the people, then you'll follow them to eternity. You'll follow them anywhere. I mean, you'd be amazed how far people will follow if you. I, if I gave one crap about any character in this movie, I probably would have been able to sit through all of the useless facts that they dumped yeah. on us to keep this plot going. That is the issue. It's not the fact that, oh, there's a bunch of useless facts. Nostalgia Critic just can't sit there and pay attention. He just doesn't get it. No, it's the fact that we didn't give a shit. <laughs> yeah. That the, the characters just were nothing. Like, and if you don't care about the characters, it doesn't matter how many facts they throw at you. Like, because the facts are meaningless. Absolutely meaningless. If you don't care about if, what's going on. If you love sitting in at a high school desk with a teacher who hates their job and just <laughs> reads a book of information, if you loved that, you will adore this movie. <laughs> I, you know what? No, no, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it back. So, you're sitting in high school with a teacher who absolutely loves their job and loves giving you all of this information, but has not a fucking clue how to teach it. That's that what it is, is because the Wachowskis yeah. obviously love this shit. Yeah, no. But they true. have no clue how to disseminate it and feed it to their audience. That is the issue. It's an incompetent teacher you, you who can, loves their job, but they just don't know how to teach. Yeah, you can love what you do and you can even understand it very well, yeah. but how you communicate it is what makes you a good teacher. And, I've had and what makes you like a good the, artist. The best teachers love their job, take all sorts of useless facts that would probably bore you but then are able to disseminate it and feed it to you in a way that, wow, I care. You've made it interesting. Find the most these interesting are, parts. These are parts real people in. to me. I get it. And I've had teachers like that. I've also that had teachers, teachers who love their job and love useless facts, but just can't teach it. Yeah. And then we've also had teachers who hate their jobs and can't teach. Yeah. <laughs> so. uh, no, I think it's a very good analysis, actually. Um, so, yeah, if you like this film, I mean, like I said, like we always say, if you like a film, like it. Don't don't care about it. Don't let us change our opinion. But don't um, sit here and give us... But don't think you're going to change ours. <laughs> yeah, don't sit here and send us a bunch of facts that we missed as if we care. Mm -hmm. Because we don't. It, like, if we cared about the characters at any point, I would sit there and read through all the facts that we supposedly made a mistake on or missed and be like... Oh, wow, okay, well that completely changes my opinion of the movie. It doesn't, because I don't give a crap about the characters. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it'll, you know what I would love to see? Um, maybe it'll happen now. I would love to see the Wachowskis go back and do a smaller project like Bound. I know that's the okay. cliche thing to say whenever an artist gets too big and stuff like that, but it's like, oh, I Bound was the to. only one from beginning to end for me that I'm like, that was fucking fantastic. Like, I can't think of a problem in that film. It was so I, I like The Matrix, actually, but... I but, bound, but you know what I mean? Bound is about yeah. as close to perfection bound is they very, have done. Bound... What do you think about it? I, I really like The Matrix, but okay, I, okay. I... I would... They're tied, maybe, in my head. Um, you know, I, not, I don't think Bound is perfect either like the, both the matrix and bound have a few little problems but i think their strengths completely outweigh the negatives mm. so either film i think is good but i i do think that it's clear that going down the road of big budget like i i agree with you and i think me may, maybe this is a wake-up call to them maybe this is like a healthy thing like you know what, we can't do this anymore because no one's going to give them money. I will be amazed, actually maybe horrified. <laughs> I would be horrified if after Jupiter Ascending, like, somebody's just like, you know what, let's give them another $200 million <laughs> and see what they can pull out next. Like, it, I, I think between this and the career of Shyamalan, because Shyamalan is the great example. I think any studio is just like, looks at what happened with Shyamalan and that's the template and they're like, Oh, these Wachowskis. Yeah, we've seen what happened with Shyamalan. We can't, no, we can't do this. Like, I, I think they're only going to be able to do small budget films for a while. They may be able to work themselves back up the ladder. I would love to see that because there's clearly very intelligent minds there. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, clearly very charismatic people, too. Again, they have to keep getting this money for these films. Yeah, and I, uh, I'm sure very nice. Like I said, every interview they I've seen, they seem really cool and really nice. I will say, in a strange way, it was another good Chicago movie because they. That was my problem. They made great use of 
the loop in downtown Chicago. The beginning of that scene is great, that action <laughs> But, um, yeah, the, the issue I have is all of the shots of the city are fantastic. All the shit in the foreground going on is what sucks. Like, the, the little space battles along the Chicago no, and, River, and I'm like... I don't believe any of this is real. There's no sense of no, physics. You know what? It was it was so good when it was just him on the boots going around, jumping around. Because again, they're really there. They're the people going yeah. through, and they're on strings and stuff. Or if not, they green screen. But there's something actually there. Then they're like, "Oh, hey, let's get on our ships and fly around for another ten minutes." And then it's like you're looking at nothing. You're looking at clouds. It, it, it's the, like just this phase, just nothing. The, the battles in the city just didn't. I kept looking at the city, and I'm like, wow, gorgeous shot. Nice. And then, but there's no, and this is a problem I have with a lot of CGI stuff, is when you do it with CGI, there's no sense of real-world physics. I'm like, just nothing, I, it's literally like watching a cartoon. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if I can't believe that this shit's really there because you're just making it do whatever you want without putting a lot of thought into the physics behind it, it just takes me out of it. I'm like, okay, here's a bunch of little ships going... Pew, 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 pew. That's all I see. I was like, I feel like I'm back in the Atari days. Or I'm gonna... <laughs> it just doesn't feel real to me. So, so yeah, there it is. Uh, we're going to end it here before we lose more lights. And uh, we'll see you at the next one. Later.